Gantt project in 2020, I think it was, and it was sponsored by the European Union. They wanted to check whether there was still discrimination and bias in recruitment in the UK. So they went um, to apply to like, I think it was like 3,000 or something different jobs. And they used different um, people to apply for those jobs. So on some of the CVs, they would put, you know, Nigerian person with a Nigerian name. On some, it would be an Eastern European and all the rest of it. And they found that the, I think it was particular Nigerian Pakistan, they had to put in double or triple the amount of applications to be able to get an interview, even though the qualifications were exactly the same. To kick things off, your background in diversity, equity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. A very important space. I think it's very important. There's some people that don't think it's as important. Um, I've been to, I don't know if it's a Twitter algorithm or I don't know, or if it's, that's just what the world looks like right now. But I'm seeing a lot more comments and tweets from people saying about how DEI is BS and it's not important, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'd like to understand a bit about you and your personal motivations to kick things off. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from my perspective, uh, clearly I'm a, I'm a black woman. Um, I am second generation, I think, um, mm. British, Ca British Caribbean. So my mum came here when she was probably a teenager, along with my grandmother. Um, and so I grew up very much in a, in a Christian household, um, and I grew up with a lot of stories, actually, I think from my mum in particular about when they came to this country and the kind of the racism that they experienced. But I think as I grew older and I think being in, in the UK, after a while, I noticed that my mum is quite jaded and some of that that other generation, they're quite jaded in the fact that they've kind of boxed themselves off into a place of this is how far I'm going to be allowed to succeed. So I might be allowed to buy a house because I'm giving them my money and I might be allowed to have a job because that's how I pay my taxes. But there's only going to be so far that they, whoever they is, is going to allow me to get as a black person in this country. And so... What I've noticed, I think, and 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 uh, sorry, this is a long-winded way of me ask, answering it's what my motivation good, no. is, but I think going into then in the spaces that I was in, the people spaces where I was working with people, what I've noticed is, is a lot of those ideals that come from our parents have, and I, I'm speaking from a Caribbean perspective because I think it is very different um, and we'll talk about that later, but that's one of the things that I concentrate on as well is trying to make sure that people are educated about the cultural differences and so that they don't just bung everyone in one pot. But I think I, I, I found that because Caribbeans were in this country for so long and they experienced a lot of the racism from white people from coming here, I think that that kind of jaded, um, not necessarily low expectation, but, and I don't know whether this is something that you were taught as well which I think is a universal brown black coloured person thing which is you have to work a hundred times harder or ten times harder than a white person to get the same opportunities or to get to the same place and I think that part of my motivation is to debunk that because I know that coming up um, and when I've looked and I've seen people that have, have succeeded so part of my background is human resources I worked uh, very much at um, a board level advising people as to who to bring on their board you know onto their c-suite and when I looked at the people that were coming through it was the people with a mindset that not only that they can but also that it's kind of a given so it's almost like this kind of brazen expectation that people that are the majority presenting have once they reach that level of kind of middle management leadership, whatever it is, that maybe we don't always have. So my motivation for a lot of what I do is to change the minds and the perspective of people that look like me so that they understand that it should it is an expectation for them too um and that the the way that we have been operating is a lot of it is due to 
who has come before us and the lives that they were living and that we need to understand that we're living a different life now. Um, and as much as opportunities are open to us, if we don't have that belief in our own selves, if we don't have that um, expectation, then we're not going to be able to seize the opportunities in the right way. So sorry for that long winded no, explanation. No, no, it's, it's a very good explanation. It sets a lot of good context, actually. When you ask about whether that was my experience growing up in terms of the messages from the parents and the, the, the older generation, yeah, somewhat. Um, I come from a black African background, mm -hmm. but I feel a lot of black people, black Caribbean, black African, that message is universal. Yeah. When, when you're based over, in, in, over here in the UK, a lot of people, a lot of my friends, a lot of people I've interacted with have told me they heard the exact same message mm -hmm. and you've got to work twice as hard, you've got to yeah. put in the extra work, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, it's something I relate with. And also when you talk about your motivation and that belief aspect and then as you're talking i'm thinking yeah i feel like some synergies somewhat between what you're saying and also with a thousand voices in the mm -hmm. sense that pretty, well, pretty much pretty much the same thing like in the sense that we want to amplify positive people so that other black britons watching it can believe and be like yeah. okay wow okay if dawn can do it if so and so can do it then i can do it as well yeah uh, so uh, yeah uh, it does set some very good context actually with your what was your experience like in the workplace when you were working in HR? Yeah, I think that the one thing that I would say is inauthenticity. So um, I obviously I and, and I I'm very open about the fact as well that I don't have a degree. So when I came, I went to university a lot of times, <laughs> um, <laughs> but never actually completed it. And I think that part of my whole thing is that I do believe that I can kind of do what I want, really. That's kind of how I feel about things. So, but when I was trying to make my way up the ladder into that, that kind of um, direction of being in HR, I did experience a lot of are you sure you can do that? I don't think you can do that. I think that you're going to need X, that sort of. Um, and then I also think that when I got to a certain level in my career, when I started to be a consultant and things like that, you would see things like, you know, I'd walk into a room and they wouldn't think it was me that was running the project. Mm. Or I'd be um, in a meeting where people knew I was running the project and I'd be gaslit or spoken over or undermined or that type of thing. But I also realised that Although I had gotten to that place in my career, I was still coming from the thinking of, I'm happy to be here. I should be grateful to be here. I should be glad that they've let me into the space to be able to prove myself. And it was all of that sort of um, mindset that I had, which is why I think my energy was giving off you can undermine me and you can gaslight me and you can look at me and think that I can't be in charge of anything. And, you know, all of that type of thing. So I did experience a lot of that, but I would definitely say inauthenticity, the inability to be myself in the space that I was in. And it sounds like a trivial thing, but if you think about that built up over weeks and years, and you think about the amount of time that we spend in the workplace um, overall, and if you're unable to be yourself, and I'm not talking about unprofessionalism, because I think that's a totally different thing. But when you're unable to express yourself authentically, it's actually, um, can become a mental health issue because when you're in this particular space, in this case, the workplace, um, I'm having to pretend, I'm having to act, I'm having to think first before I, what am I saying? How am I looking? How are they perceiving me? Is it the right way? Am I showing the right face? It's all of that type of thing. And it becomes a mental health issue. So that was my main, that was my main problem I guess that I experienced when I was working with people trying to fit in being inauthentic um yeah and I think that was part of what drove me into working more for myself trying to discover who I was and then also having a determination to also help other people 
to be their authentic self because only in doing that will they be successful. So, you know, I read this, I read something this literally this morning and I'm, I'm probably, I'm going to get the numbers wrong. So please, <laughs> if anyone's listening, please don't quote me yeah. on the exact numbers, but it was a report. So it was a, they surveyed just over a thousand black women, black British women, I think it was, and asked, um, I think it was a third of them had left a place of work before because they didn't feel safe mm -hmm. at that place of work. And then my immediate thought when I read that was, if that's what that report says, I feel like the number's probably even understated because there's, I know a lot of women, myself, black women, who don't feel safe, don't feel supported in their place of work, but haven't left mm -hmm. because maybe they don't feel like they have the choice to leave, maybe because, because life, I suppose, yeah. there's bills and whatever, and maybe like, it's just not that easy all the time to get yeah, up and leave. to be able so to leave. So if that number is, if I'm getting the number right anyways, but I feel like if that's the case, that they've left, that number's understated, which probably means that there's an even bigger problem, a massive issue with a lot of black women, maybe black staff at whole, who aren't feeling safe, aren't feeling like the workplace that they're working in is an inclusive environment. Mm -hmm. And it's leading to all of these massive, like, um, what do you call it, attrition rates for black staff and all sorts of stuff, you know, when it comes to black staff in particular, um, or maybe some other groups as well in the workplace. Uh, in Would you say you're, in your time when you was working in corporate, was it, is that, I mean, was that, would you say it was a safe place for you? Do you feel like it was or? Wow. Um, no, because if it was, I would have been able to be authentic. So mm -hmm. the inauthenticity is a protection mechanism. You blend in by being like everybody else so that people don't, notice you to attack you in whatever you feel that that attack uh, may be. And some of it is in things like isolation, you know, not being included, um, not feeling like you can be included. And then some of that is also in, in things like um, not being given a, a particular project or th that type of thing. So, and it's also... <laughs> There's a certain thing, you know, when especially if you've been working somewhere for a long time where you feel like your colleagues and your team or whatever, you know, that your workplace has your back in a certain aspect, um, even if it's just about your progression, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I would say, no, I didn't feel safe in that environment. I didn't feel as if they had my back. Yeah. And was d a thing when you was working? So funnily enough, ironically, when I started out in um, HR, I was working for local government and I went in as an equalities officer um, and we spent most of the time dealing with the community. So equality and diversity in the community, but also there was some aspects of internal. And at the time when I was working, there was when the Equality Act came out, the 2010 Equality Act. So I, I, I worked for that local authority to do their new uh, equality and diversity policy. And so the funny story about all of that is, so I, I'm an equality officer. I then got promoted to senior equality and diversity officer and we're running all of these programs you know talking about how we can make things more equitable both for the residents of the county but also within the organization and then I had my last daughter and um, she um, had a series of complications that didn't show up till maybe she was about six months or so and so she ended up being in Great Ormond Street for a really you know, long time back and forth. We didn't know what was wrong with her. And I went and asked for flexible working. So I went and I asked, you know, can I work from home because I'm going back and forth to the hospital? I'm not really sure what was happening. And they refused. And I appealed and I thought, I'm working in uh, equality and diversity. I've got a daughter that has likely got a disability. I am um, a, a mother, a carer, all of that kind of thing. And I'm asking you for flexible working and you're not giving it to me. And the reasons that you're, you're giving is you're basically hinting that you think that I won't work mm -hmm. if I'm at home. Now, obviously this is, we're talking about 10 years before COVID and 2020 and this whole revolution of, you know, the way that we work. But I remember feeling at the time, like, this is all of, this whole thing is all a fraud. This is all a facade. We've got this department 
where we're talking about equality and diversity and how we can make things more inclusive for people. But then you've got an example in-house with you now of somebody who has caring responsibilities, um, who's obviously does come from a marginalised background, I guess, and is asking for some support so that she can do her job effectively whilst also dealing with what's happening outside. And I remember I went back and I tried to negotiate. I said, you know, can we do it for three months? Can we do it for six months? And you just kept saying no. They kept saying no. And so I left. I left and I... um, So when you're talking about people not feeling safe, that would have been one of my earliest and I think the most ironic examples that you could get. Because DEI was a thing um, and I was the DEI person and was being, you know, discriminated against. And it's a really strange thing because um, it's a massive local authority. And I see people from there all the time, like, you know, and particularly because my daughter does have a disability. She's one of 14 children in the world with Mm -hmm. the condition that she has. And so this local authority, I live in that area and they are providing services for my daughter. And I'm still seeing the holes in how they deal with things from an equality and diversity perspective for example i had someone from the local authority when i asked them for something for my daughter and they said oh we can't do that because we give everybody the same and i said um yeah but she has different needs and they said but we but being equal is about giving everyone the same those are the words that she said to me being equal is about giving everyone the same and i went back and i said to her um so the the whole thing about diversity, equity and inclusion is not about giving everybody the same opportunity because otherwise there will be nobody behind. It's about meeting the needs of the people. And I said, I'm disappointed that you work in this kind of area um, and have no concept about what equality and diversity actually is. But yeah, again, another of my long-winded, convoluted yeah. ways of saying something. Absolutely. I like the long answers. Okay. <laughs> it, it gives good context. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, the person you was talking about, just at the end there, sounds like madness to me. What pops into my head, there's an image. It's like a meme, basically. I've seen on social some time back, and it was an interviewer, I think, and they were, oh, well, it's like an interviewer interviewing like a bunch of different animals on how well they can climb a tree. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you've seen the picture. Then you'll have, like, one fish. Then you've got a monkey. Then you've okay. got an elephant. Then you've got a gorilla. And just, like, uh, equal opportunities. Give them all the same... Give same, them all the same The same, same, the same interview, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing, but come on. They <laughs> like, can't all access it in the same way. Yeah, they got different needs. Yeah. One, like, yeah. one... It's, yeah. But it was when she said it, I was so shocked. I think I wrote something on my LinkedIn about it. I think I did a post. Mm. And I basically... I called them out. I called out the, the council... And I said, you know, like, this is why we're not getting anywhere. You have people working in departments that should be centred on equality and diversity or diversity, equity and inclusion who don't have a clue what it is. And I didn't have to even ask or look, because this is all over email. I didn't have to ask or look as to what colour she was. It was not even a question for me. I know that it was a white lady. Um, I know that she was of a certain demographic, as in age group. And I think that some of the work that we need to do is to address those people, the Gen Xs um, and above, who like your people that you were saying in Cornwall that had never seen black people before, haven't experienced them, and so therefore don't understand anything about our needs they're looking at us like oh it's just the color of your skin and I'm like there's a whole culture behind here there's a whole history there's a lot of things that make us who we are it's not just that I'm brown and you are white because that's easily corrected in a tanning shop right so um it's about what comes with me as a black woman yeah, in, in this D, D, E, and I space, one thing I really dislike, there's not many things in this world I really dislike. One thing I really dislike in general is lip service. Mm-hmm. And I've seen a lot of lip service in the D, E, and I space. I've, there's, I've got two friends who both work at two large global corporations and they've mm-hmm. both experienced ra- that very overt forms of racism. I'm not talking covert stuff. I mean, overt to your face form of racism right. in their teams, in their place of work. And they've reported it 
and both of them, one of them ended up leaving the firm. The other one kind of got bullied out of the team. Right. Uh, and the firm didn't do anything about it. But if you go onto their websites, you'll find like in-depth pages about all the different groups and that kind of thing. I'm mm -hmm. like, take, they used to just get rid of all of that page because it don't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Because now yeah. when somebody puts, you throws it onto your lap, you don't have to, just throws it onto your lap and says, this is the problem. Come in, then this is the chance for them to come and demonstrate what they put on the website and all the stuff they talk about. They're not really doing anything yeah. about it. So it's just lip service. Yeah. I'm, I'm really not a fan of that kind of thing. And I have seen a bit of it, well, quite a lot of it in the in this space. And it sounds a bit like that local authority, maybe to some degree, maybe not exactly the same, but to some degree, yeah. you know. Um, and yeah, some people definitely need to do some learning. And some and I, you know, you're, you're, you're right. And one of the things that I have on my website when I talk about the work that I do with DE&I strategy is that, that I make sure that your DE&I policy um, is brought to life and it's not just words on a page. Um, and I think that this whole lip service thing, and I know that you said in the beginning that you've noticed that, you know, if you go on Twitter or whatever, that people are saying DEI is a waste of time and it's all of that kind of thing. So I was speaking to somebody about this the other day and I said, it's so funny because when we had 2020, when we had the whole COVID thing and then we had the Black Lives Matter movement and we had, and we saw all these people, you know, all the black squares and companies mobilizing and people were, you know, emailing me, Dawn, can you come and do this talk? Can you come and do this training? Are you able to coach our leaders? Are you able to do all of this stuff? And I remember thinking at the time, they're doing this because, you know, the image of the whole George Floyd murder, there was no denying for most people, regardless of what you think that the circumstances were, that that was a barbaric act that happened. And so because we were also in a very emotional time, as in in COVID, people's families were dying basically it was a situation that I know that I have never experienced in my lifetime so we were all in a very emotional headspace the whole thing happened with George Floyd we had protests on the on the streets all the rest of it and so companies quite rightly mobilized and started to do things but the problem is is that they didn't really understand the root of why it was necessary they were actually firefighting or reacting to a situation and putting things in place that they thought would fix that situation at the time or would make it more palatable because you want your employees to feel as if they're supported, as if, you know, all of those things are happening. We talk a lot in DEI about having inclusive environments in the workplace and that doing things like increasing people's um, organisations profit margins and making people more productive and all the rest of it and we talk about that and companies that say you know they've seen x amount of percentage of growth from having more inclusive teams more inclusive leadership but i think that people don't believe it i don't know whether it's believed because it's not done enough and that's what i mean about the understanding of the root the understanding of the why are we doing this? So since 2020, we've had all of those things. We've had loads of initiatives and loads of different people are doing loads of different things. And now we're here in 2024 and we've still got uh, black people taking their companies to tribunal. We've still got the lowest representation of black and brown people at senior levels in the largest companies. We've still got things like when there is discrimination in organisations, uh, there are studies that show that when it comes down to race, they're not investigated. They're kind of, what normally happens, and this is coming from a HR person, is the business will um, say, let's try and see if we can pull it to bed, which you know, you don't want to have a big lot, lot of, lit, lit, you know, having to have litigation or anything like that if you don't need to. However, there's a line of uh, sweeping things under the carpet and kind of gaslighting in that moment. So what I found is a lot of the time what will happen is they will go to said black person and say, oh, I don't think that, you know, I'm sure that they didn't mean it like that. And maybe we need to put them on training course. And, you know, I'm sure they had the best intentions. Why are you trying to paint the sainthood of somebody that has been discriminatory towards me? I don't, you know, it's that type of thing where we're then being gaslighted to feel guilty for complaining. So when we've had this mediation meeting or whatever it is that you want to do to placate me um 
then there's no further action that's being done. And that's coming out in studies as well. Um, and so I think that when we look at what happened in 2020 and the effort that businesses started to put in and how it's tailed off now, I think it's be simply because they didn't understand the root of it and also because we are not making noise anymore. We were making noise then. There was a big about it and I think that we too have become jaded again and just a bit like if you would like to understand how you can use your voice to drive change how you can craft compelling stories to move audiences and for additional wisdom from the guests that we have on the podcast sign up to our newsletter every single week we send actionable pieces of advice to change makers like you so if you haven't already the sign up link for the newsletter will be in the description of this episode. Yeah. Yeah. I think with the businesses, th that was definitely a massive example of lip service because a lot of these organizations that are posting black squares are the same ones now disbanding their employee resource groups and yeah. not hiring anyone else in those kind of spaces anymore. It was definitely lip service because it was the thing to do. Yeah. That summer, it was, you have to do, you just, you have to do one. So they just do it, or whatever. There's someone I had in the podcast, uh, she was talking about how she had, done some work for an organization. And then when it came time to pay them, they weren't answering the other. No phone calls, no emails. Wow. And then she went onto someone, um, the person that was meant to be processing the payment, went onto her Instagram page. And in the bio, it had the black, you know the the black, um, oh, you know what was it? The black links kind of thing. Oh, when you yeah. click and it shows you all black organizations you can support. And she was like, well, what's this? What's, this <laughs> what's, about? Going, what's going yeah, on? Like, yeah. Massive lip service. So yeah. she's put on her Instagram because it's the cool thing to do. And it's not even her own money. Like just yeah. <laughs> it's the company's money. Just pay, just pay them pay. for the work. Yeah, yeah. Too much lip but service. But they don't value it. I think that's that's the whole thing is that they're not valuing it. I'm 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 saying that because I, I have noticed a few more organizations trying to do different things um in terms of their programs, but I still think that they're not getting it for some of the things that they're trying to do. And I think it's particularly when you're working with black and brown people, um, when you're trying to develop them, is that you can't give them the same thing that you will give to a white leader. Because I'm gonna give coaching as an example because it's one of the things that I know. So if I'm going in and I'm doing a group coaching session, Part of what we talk about, first of all, is them being in a safe space. So this is in a safe space to explain your circumstances or your experiences, a bit like how we've been talking today, um, so that you can identify where you then have certain beliefs or certain things that might be inhibiting you from being able to take on your opportunities that are available to you, or not even just from that perspective. When I've spoken to some of the clients that I work with and they say, you know, they've had white coaches, say, for example, and they're doing a leadership development program. And what they're doing is they're taking the leadership development program that they have and they're saying what we're going to do to give you an opportunity as a black leader is we're going to let make sure that we've got spaces on this leadership development program for black individuals. And that's all fine. Great thing to do. I'm not criticizing it. But there's almost like something different that you also need to do with those black individuals because they're not coming from the same space of that knowing of it's mine and I can do it. And also when you're thinking about your leadership qualities and what you've had to emulate as leaders and what experiences you have had, you can't really explore that within yourself to be able to come, you know, to enhance your leadership abilities without confronting some of your experiences, some of the things that you've grown up with, some of your mindset things. And if you're dealing with a coach that comes from a white background, it may not be that they have the empathy or the um, understanding of where you're coming from to be able to help you to see your next step. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. It's like with therapy, for example. It's like having a black therapist versus, versus a non-black therapist. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a different, it's different. Yeah. Um, I've done therapy before. I've had a white therapist, I've had a black therapist, and it's, it's different. Like, uh, taking aside their skill and how well they are doing the therapy work, the fact that the black therapist can relate in a way that 
a therapist from another background can't relate makes it so much more powerful, so yeah. much more effective. And like you said, it's about, it's not about delivering the exact same thing to every single group of person. It's about who they are, meet them where they are meet and adjusting it yeah. based on their background, their particular needs. The, the most ironic thing about this conversation so far is the fact that you were the DNA person at your organization and then were discriminated against yeah. in your own organization, left and now you're teaching organizations now, this is how you got to do it. Because yeah, <laughs> yeah. you guys are getting it wrong. Yeah. And there's a lot of people getting it wrong. And then we spoke about at the start, there's some prominent people who are really anti DNA. Really. So you see, like, Elon Musk is always tweeting about how anti DNA he is. You got Candice Owens, who's another prominent person, is very. I watched a little bit of one of her videos maybe yesterday or a couple of days ago, maybe half of one of them. She got quite a lot of videos talking about it. I watched maybe half of one of them. And one of her main arguments was you should just hire someone who's the best regardless of if they're black. I can't remember. Is that something like that, basically? So if you want, and she was kind of suggesting that, you know, the airplane that had the panel that went off. Oh, yeah. She was suggesting it happened because of DNA, basically, because they had a black person or something like that. But anyways, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think she, she tries to paint a very logical argument. I, I don't agree with it exactly. Um, but that's that's her stance on it, and then Elon Musk, and then uh, probably a bunch of other people who have that particular that similar kind of stance. H have you come across anyone in your personal career work so far with that kind of stance? So what do you say to people like that? Okay, I thought he was going to ask me in general because I was going to say who Piers Morgan. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the name that cannot be mentioned. The that name, one, he who must not be named. <laughs> yeah. Um, have I? I don't think somebody that would be so overt with it because a lot of the spaces that I come into, I've heard, I've been in spaces where I've heard, um, like I've gone to a workshop or to some sort of um, conference and you hear people that are making comments about that, like talking about things like, isn't this uh, positive discrimination or if we're doing this is it not uh, why are we favoring them shouldn't it just be the best person for the role and all of that kind of thing so I have been in conversations where those comments have been made and my thing is always yes it should be the best person for the role but the problem is is that the pool of people that you have that could be considered the best person for the role do not include those that you held back for centuries it doesn't include those people. So who you have as the best people for the role, I'm not saying that there isn't going to be somebody, a, a black person or, you know, an Asian person or whatever that is, it could also be considered, but you've got a lot less of us in that pool because of things that have been, because uh, of our experience and the life that we have had to kind of live for centuries and where that has us now as a as a group of people and also from the other side is that yes it should be the best people for the job but we know that psychologically for everybody that we all like to be around people who are like us it's not a discrimination thing it's not a racism thing it's just life isn't it so you know I would rather hang around with you maybe than I might want to hang around with uh, my white next door neighbor it's not, you, I don't dislike him. It's just that we have more in common. Yeah. So when we look at things from that perspective and we look at it from a, a scientific point of view, the fact remains is, yes, it should be the best person for the job, but you are going to be, as an interviewer, as a hirer, you are going to be attracted to either somebody that you've seen in that type of job before, something that's familiar to you, or somebody that reminds you of someone you know, or somebody that's like you. And so... And, um, um, you know, I don't know whether you've heard, there's been a lot of evidence that's come out recently that all of the years of unconscious bias training that we've been doing, and I do a lot of unconscious bias training, um, that all of it hasn't really made a difference in bias, in recruitment, definitely. Um, there was a project called the... Um, Gantt Project in 2020, I think it was, and it was sponsored by the European Union. And they basically um, went and applied to, I think they wanted to check whether there was still discrimination and bias in recruitment in the UK. So they went um, to apply to like, I think it was like 3000 or something different jobs. And they used different um, 
people to apply for those jobs. So on some of the CVs, they would put, you know, Nigerian person with a Nigerian name. On some, it will be an Eastern European and all the rest of it. And they found that the, I think it was particular Nigerian Pakistan, they had to put in double or triple the amount of applications to be able to get an interview, even though the qualifications were exactly the same. So identical CVs, all that was different was the name and where they were born. Um, and this was in 2020, 2021 is when that evidence came out. So when we're talking about bias in recruitment and thinking it doesn't exist, it does still exist because part of it is a human uh, construct of us, you know. And so if you're so although they're saying it's the best person for the job, coming back around to my point, although they're saying they're the best, it's about the best person for the job, it's not our own human attributes get in the way of that. So by having more people in the pool that are people of colour, you are more likely to make a fair assessment when it comes to who is the best person for the job. Uh, I didn't know about that. That that oh, um, yeah. that study that that's that's mad, yeah. and I suppose you can't argue the data. No, the data's and out it's there. UK and it's recent. Yeah. So yeah. Do you advocate for? I think they call them blind CVs. I think they're called. Yeah, blind CVs where you sort of delete, you take out the the name, the anything that's identifying of the person. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I think that that works. I also think that people should use more technology. Although another funny and ironic story is that they were showing that AI where they were using AI to sift, not in this project, this is another thing, they were using AI to do the recruitment, so to do CV sifting and all the rest of it. When they went back and studied it, because it's us that teaches the AI, the AI was also making bias decisions. Oh my gosh. So they were also looking at where people went to university, where they were from, what their names were, all the rest of it. And it was skewing because the AI mind comes from the human mind and the human mind for some people is inherently racist. So, um, yeah. <laughs> this is which, is, where we are. which is why they say it's important for black people to be involved in the building of technology as well. So the technology doesn't perpetuate doesn't, societal yeah, yeah. racism. And also <laughs> being, it's not just about being involved and it's not just being in those spaces. We need to be in all spaces at leadership level because that's the only way that we're going to be able to influence um, anything. Are you seeing a shift in terms of like, because from my perspective, I don't know the numbers and I don't, I don't necessarily work in the space in the way you work in the space, but in your time in this world, are you seeing a shift in terms of more black people in senior leadership positions? And also, are you seeing a shift in attitude as well? I'm seeing a shift in more black people. Not sure about the attitude. I think that it is cool and trendy to make sure that you are putting more black people into higher level spaces, but I don't know whether the, what am I looking for? What's the word? The intention behind it. I'm not sure about the intentions behind it. And for some of them, you know, you spoke about lip service. For some, I think it's just about this is what we're supposed to be doing. This is how we don't get criticised. And so, you know, they can do the job. Let's just put them in those places. Then nobody can say that we're not hi hiring who we're supposed to hire. So I think there's a mixture. And I sound really cynical, actually, and I don't want to sound cynical because there are organisations that are doing amazing, you know, like when I look at the big four, for example, when I look at EY, when I, when I look at um, Cap Gemini, when I look at... Uh, PwC, those sorts of organisations, some of the larger organisations that have the money to put behind proper uh, projects and things that are thought out and not just throwing out something because it looks like, you know, it, it adds a star to my quality impact assessment or whatever it is. Um the companies that are really thinking about it and really do understand the value of diversity and inclusion and the value of us uh, being more cohesive as humanity, really. Uh, sorry to sound a little bit deep there. Um, <laughs> but those organisations are making really good strides. And if you speak to some of the people that are black people that work in those places, they will be able to tell you and explain. The one thing that I would say is that I do still find that their DE&I spaces in some of those bigger organisations are still very white. 
right. And again, it's a strange one because we have the argument of organisations always hiring black people or people of colour to be the DE&I director or, you know, that type of thing. Um, and it being like, you know, that's when we're useful. That's when we get director and board level roles when it has to do with DE&I. And I hear it and I understand it. And it's not, you know, just because I'm black doesn't mean I'm best placed to deal with people with disabilities, for example, or people who are neurodiverse or, you know, whatever it is, or the transgender, um, you know, what's going on with transgender issues. I might not be best placed, but what I do understand is marginalisation. And what I do understand is being a minority. That is where me as a black woman with my inter, um, you know, interdependent uh, roles comes in and where it can help your organisation. So where I understand from the perspective of don't just use us as your face of DE&I, I also understand that there is a reason for having people from marginalised groups, not just black people, people from other groups to be able to lead that work as well. Through this conversation, you've spoken about how organisations are getting it wrong um, in parts here and there, and also spoke about ways, inferred, I suppose, ways in which organisations can do better, again, in parts. But in a wild light to understand now, just to sort of bring that together, mm. is how can organisations and individuals within organisations do better when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion? I think... For me, the first step of anything is awareness. So it's them recognising, first of all, or doing some sort of investigation to ascertain what the issue is. Because until they see what the issue is, they will have no motivation to want to change that. So it's knowing what exactly the issue is. Is there an issue? What exactly is it? And if you go to change that issue, how will that benefit the organisation? Because I, I make no... Um, I don't pretend to not know that everything is going to be about profit. They're not going to do things as a favour to us. It's going to be about how that, um, but it's also them understanding in that awareness how their company culture plays into their profit, how having productive employees plays into their profit, all of those things. So I think for organisations, how they can do it better is to make that assessment of where they are now and then to look at, OK, so if this is where we are now, we've been doing a lot of things for a long time. Why have we not gone further? And at that point is when you need to speak to your demographic and you need to speak to the people that work in your organisation. And if you haven't got enough people that work in your organisation, you can get a consult. You can get somebody like me to come in and try to help you with, um, you know, to really understand what would be needed for you to change the dynamic of your organisation and to do better and to really have, I, I talk a lot about unbelonging in the workplace. And so that's why when I describe who, what I am and what I do, I describe myself as a diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging strategist, because that's really what it's about is with all of the things that you're doing, me as a black person, as a person of colour, I should be able to feel like I still belong in your organisation, even with my own identity, even with my own culture, even with my own experiences. When I come here, when I'm at work, I feel like I'm part of something. And that's kind of where you're trying to get to as an organisation. Now, quickly, before we get into this episode, a quick word from our sponsor, us. Or in other words, 1000 Visuals, the production company behind 1000 Voices. With 1000 Voices, I was looking for a studio that had that high quality cinematic and homely feel to it, but I just couldn't find anywhere. So we decided to open up our own space. We've got four high quality cinema cameras. We've got shotgun mics, not those podcasting mics that cover half your face as well. So people can see you when you're speaking to them. And we've got some basic amenities as well. Water herbal teas, espressos, you name it. We'd love to invite you to come down to our space to create some content with us. If you are interested, check the link in the description and I'd love to take you on a tour of this space and invite you to come record some stuff with us. Thank you. Now let's get back to the episode. And also for black staff in this organisation. So we spoke about, I brought up two examples of two friends who experienced discrimination at work and it didn't get resolved. You you spoke about 
organizations that try to brush these sort of things under the rug, which is precisely what happened to these two friends. And they try and gaslight the person maybe a bit just so to get rid of it, basically. So mm -hmm. they don't have to deal with any litigation, that kind of thing. What about black staff that have or are experiencing a level of discrimination? Sometimes people might experience very overt forms where it's like it's so clear what this is. Or sometimes it might be even a bit more, you know, it's covert. You're not 100. Well, you as the staff, you're yeah. not sure. But it's one of the ones, if you call it out now. You feel like, yeah, then, will it be, am I doing the race card? Am I any yeah, of that kind of stuff? And yeah. they'll turn around and say, I didn't mean that. And then you look like the bad guy because you brought it up. But for black staff who are struggling at work, um, maybe have that unbelonging, they're struggling, face and level of discrimination. Maybe don't feel like they belong. Um, don't feel like it's an inclusive environment. What would you adv advise to them? So um, the funny thing, the other day I did a training uh, and part of this came up in it. So we were talking about microaggressions and obviously we all know what microaggressions are. And I was talking about the whole over and the covert type thing. So one of the things that I suggest that black staff do is to just write everything down in the first instance. Sometimes, you know, somebody might say something or do something and we're just like, did they... I'm not sure whether it was, <laughs> yeah. you know, like I'm not, but what you recognize with people in general is that there will generally be a pattern over time. And so if it's things where you think it's covert and it's not obvious, I would start to just keep a record of those things. And then when you get an opportunity and it might be in your one-to-one -one with your manager, it may be more openly in, in your employee resource group. It might be, you know, wherever it is that you can mention, these are some of the things that I've experienced over this period that have made me feel uncomfortable. And, you know, that I know that it may not be looked at as it has been said, but when you've got it listed one after the other, it helps because really what our job is to do and again, it's a controversial subject, but what our job is to do is to educate in some kind of way. We always say like, it's not our job to tell, it's not our job as black people to tell white people where they're going wrong, but it is their, it is our job for them to learn about, to teach them about us. Because otherwise, how will we know? They can read books about stuff, but until they mm. understand that when we were coming home from wherever in the evening and we asked for McDonald's and our parents said there's rice at home, <laughs> that that was a serious... No, but, you know, they understand now why we, you know, as adults may behave in a certain way or think a certain way. You can't understand me unless you understand my experiences so that part the teaching about our cultural differences how we feel about things when you might talk to us in a certain way and why we might take offense because of our background they're never going to know that unless we tell them so that's the first thing i'll say write down all of your instances share that also make an effort to talk to people be a bit more open about who you are and as a black person so that they can start to learn because we are sometimes quite standoffish we can be you know as we would call it stush or a little bit you know um so we have to also be more open and then i think the third thing is understanding that if you don't stand up for yourself nothing will change because it then happens as a collective so if we stay silent about things if we you know turn the other cheek all the time if we don't and again in a professional way in the smartest way possible but you have to make sure that people know that they can't just treat you in a certain way otherwise things will never change even if you're becoming a thorn in, in someone's uh, side it's better to be a thorn because then they've got to take it out so it means they've got to do an action of some kind um so yeah that's what i would kind of say and Perfect. just believe in yourself really um and what you are what you deserve um, and then you just won't take nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That's great. Okay. Have I missed anything? Have you got any final words? So. Oh, have I got any final words? Um, I think my final words are, um, there are people like, there are me and people like me who are really trying to move the needle on um, the grassroots of the matter, which is working with 
people of colour, people from underrepresented backgrounds from a perspective of understanding and meeting them where they are um, and that there's a lot happening in individual lives because of that. People being more able to be confident and to go forward into their roles and also understanding what they need to do to stay visible, to make sure that they are putting their best foot forward, that they're building their own personal brand. Because we think about all of these things as people throwing things on us but we have to remember that we are our brand even in the workplace and I you buy from people that you trust and like so how are you showing up whilst being authentic how are you showing up whilst being authentic to bring your own personal brand and make people want to buy from you um and I guess that will be my final words Perfect. This is so good. You're clearly very passionate about yes. this subject and I can feel it as you're speaking. So thank you so much. And I've learned a lot. It's been very educational oh, as well. Good. <laughs> I pick, pick it up on the passion, but I'm also learning a lot. So thank you so much for coming down today. I really, really appreciate you thank coming you. down. Thank once you. Thank you for having me, Albert. It's been good. I've never been in a proper podcast studio before. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. So thank you for coming down once again. This is um, Dawn Morton Young. This is 1,000 1, Voices. And now, people, we're out. <laughs>